what are some of the most underrated games on the HBCU schedule this year? And then also, what was the fate of our HBCU rookies on Roster Cut Day? Oh, yeah, it's Locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are Locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU Podcast, your number one. Daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU Athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports Editor. Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked On HBCU your first listen of the day every day. And we're going to start off with something that is major to me, and it's something that I wanted to discuss for a couple of weeks at this point, but I wanted to make sure that we got it done during our first week. So I wanted to make sure it was either week zero or week one in that time frame. And it's kind of a outlook into the whole schedule. We're not just talking about week one. We're talking about all FCS HBCU match now. Emphasis on FCS. So you won't hear any CIAA, any CAC teams, any NAIA teams. You won't hear any of those on here, but only because we're specifically focusing on the SWAC, MEAC, Tennessee State, North Carolina, a and Hampton. We're specifically focusing on there. So let's get to it, right? Because we have quite a few under games on the schedule. And number one for me, this is a personal list. Mind you, this is a personal list. That's Jackson State versus Texas Southern. I have to preface it with that because y'all see it. Y'all see it. Got the Texas Southern popcorn can right there. We all know I'm an alum. I started off every episode saying it, so it's kind of hard to forget. However, I think this game is actually a pretty big game, and when I'm looking at it, it's something that people do not talk about at all. There's conversations or competitions that people don't talk about enough. People don't talk about this game at all. You would think this was a game that is completely uninteresting. Now, I understand why people say that. It's because Texas Southern is not looked at as on the same level as Jackson State. And honestly, to this point, they haven't proven that they should be, so I'm okay with that. However... This is why it is interesting. Andrew Body versus Shador Sanders. Listen, these guys are not that far apart. They aren't. I truly have that sort of confidence in Andrew Body that he is a SWAC player of the year type of guy. I threw that out of Jeremy Musa. Um, I didn't quite throw it out of D. Davis, but you know what? We can put him in a category too because it's early. You want to have more people in the conversation. I'm, I'm telling you right now, when the season is over, it's not going to be just Shador Sanders. It might not even be Shador Sanders. Who knows? However, I do know that going into the season, you have Shador as the first-team quarterback. You have Andrew Body as the second-team quarterback. And those are the two preseason all-swack quarterbacks. Now they get to go toe-to-toe. Anytime you get the two best quarterbacks in a division, in a conference, in a league, in a nation, this is – and you could argue that these two are – Two top quarterbacks in the nation when it comes to uh, HBCU quarterbacks. They are up there, right? So they're all in that conversation. Anytime you have two quarterbacks like that who get a showdown, go toe-to-toe, this is must-see TV. But because Texas Southern has not been successful, a lot of people don't want to have that conversation. The truth of the matter is this wasn't a blowout game last year, right? So even if we want to take it to that team metric, which I do believe is going to – listen, I think that – of the pack right now kind of how a quill like a quill glass had alabama a and they weren't top two so and this i think there's a little bit more quality teams in the west this year than the east last year so we'll see we'll see i still think Alcorn, uh southern grambling i still think they're all gonna be quality teams i could put texas southern at four but t- but they have the best quarterback might not let him win swag player of the year but don't get it twisted he is of that cut i mean he is cut from that cloth let's not get it confused Andrew Body versus Shador Sanders makes this must-see TV. Next is Prairie View versus Southern. And this is another one that I don't think is talked about too much. Prairie View just lost their head coach to Southern. Prairie View won the SWAC West last year, while Southern is projected to win the SWAC West this year. 
And some could say it's because of Eric Dooley. I came on and said, listen, the impact of Eric Dooley cannot be underestimated or understated. All right. But here's the thing. You're returning the coach. You also bring in J uh, Jason Dumas. And then you're also coming on and you're playing the team that is projected to take your spot. Right. The famous, the iconic, the legendary Ric Flair once said to beat a man, you got to beat the man. Now, I understand that's not always applicable in team sports, especially when you're rolling over from year to year. But here's the thing. Southern is going to need to need to beat Prairie View. And I'm telling you right now, Prairie View is not going quietly. If Southern beats the brakes off of Prairie View, that's speaking volumes because I can't tell you for fact, but I can tell you as nearly fact as somebody who's not inside the organization or inside the school, Prairie View is going to be extremely motivated. This arguably could be the best game that Prairie View plays this year because they're going against Southern University. So now with them having that extra motivation of, oh, I got to beat that coach. That coach left us for what is perceived as his dream school. You going to leave me? Now I got to come and beat you. I got to spoil this, right? Because that game is at Prairie View. I got to spoil this homecoming, period. So I think that's definitely a game that a lot of us need to look out for. I got one more for you before we go into a break real quick. And that's Alcorn versus uh, Stephen F. Austin. And it's one that my, fa uh, my uh, one of my favorite, excuse me, one of my favorite games of this weekend because it is impactful. And I told you that I was going to read off some of the viewer listeners and what they had to say. They tweeted me. I appreciated that. Um, if you saw, if you left a YouTube comment, I didn't see it when I checked in the middle of, of today. I'm sorry if I did not get it. Um, but leave one down here. Leave one down here, right? But SFA versus Alcorn is one of those games where it's a statement. Like my guy BJ Jones said in the tweet, and I'm going to bring it up. This is a statement game. This is a game where you want to show everybody in the FCS what you can be. North Carolina versus FAMU was kind of a statement game for a multitude of reasons. One of those reasons was the fact that, you know, there were 20 players missing. You still came in and you got competitive. I thought that was impressive. However, it was also a statement game to yourself of saying, like, I can compete. Look what we did. It was more individual when you're looking at it. This is a team. SFA is an FCS program that Alcorn likely feels like they can come in and beat. Jackson State, Jacksonville State, excuse me, came in and beat them. But that does not mean that Alcorn is going to just run over them. Matter of fact, I highly doubt they're going to be the favorites. You know, I just don't expect them to be. But if you beat this team, it's going to show you why they were a top 10 team in the country when it comes to FCS. I don't care if it's 0-2 now. This is still an impressive win. When speaking on this, you have to say if. You have to say if because it is a game that's tough. It is a game that if you come out and you say, oh, yeah, we knocked them off. Now you're showing, okay, that's Swack West because I already think they're going to be in that conversation. But I think a lot of people are kind of just rolling with, with Southern. But I could be wrong. We're in that conversation fully. Don't just give it up to Southern yet because Alcorn is still in that conversation. I think that's something that's on the hook. When you look at the stakes that are attached to this game, the ability to put the whole FCS on notice that we are one of those schools that can be very competitive and don't think that, oh, that SWAC school ain't going to touch us. No. These are one of the things that are up for stake, and that's why I believe it is an underrated game. Going forward, I have one more, and then I have some of the viewer submissions, and I appreciate you guys. You guys really showed up and gave me about 9, 10, uh, and I'm going to read all of them off. So I appreciate that. But going forward, let me tell you about Bet Online Now, I don't know what the odds were on Chauncey Gardner-Johnson getting traded, but I'll tell you, man, that had me sitting in my chair in the middle of the day just, <sighs> I was soaking. I was soaking. I listened to my guy Ross on Locked on Saints. I listened to some of my other local media. Made me feel a little bit more, you know, accepting of the fact that one of my guys is gone. Man, that was a bad one. But they got a lot of other odds. They got the Saints versus Falcons odds for weeks one, week one. They have some collegiate football odds for week one. They also have other sports like martial arts. They want to talk about esports. They're there as they are there as well. So you're looking at a multiple different amount of sports that you can bet on, including esports. Like I said, they have everything that you could think of: NBA futures, NFL futures, which you're also running out of time on getting. You need to go ahead if you're going to bet on who's going to win the division and all of these things before the odds start switching up. But the only one, there's only one place to do that, and that is bet online where the game starts. As we keep on rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day every day. Now, we're going to continue rolling with our underrated games on the HBCU schedule. 
this year. We have one more before we get into the viewer submissions. And I lied. We got two more because I can't pick. I thought I was going to be able to pick, but I can't. There's two games, both involving North Carolina A and T, and there was really three in the in the in the ballpark. But I decided to keep one to the viewer submission. North Carolina A and T versus Campbell, and then North Carolina A and T versus South Carolina State. Now I picked these two game for a couple of reasons one when i'm looking at a and t versus campbell and we're going to talk about campbell campbell is going to be a topic of discussion probably the first week of october here about what they really mean for hbcus they're not an hbcu but what they really mean for hbcu football this year and i think it's something that's interesting and we'll talk about that when they face i can't remember who they face on october 1st but it is an, an hbcu i think it might be central they think it might be central but when you're looking at the a and t campbell game these are the two teams that are projected to be the top two in the Big South, and it's the greatest homecoming on earth, October 29th. I would try to make it out there, but TSU homecoming the same day. So I, I got to show love to my, to my family, right? But here's the thing. The greatest homecoming on earth is one of the biggest spectacles in HBCU football, and you're adding the fact that let's just go with the preseason. This is kind of like a Big South championship game. This is a big game on a big event between two of the best teams in the conference. Wow, that is an underrated game because it does not get talked about too much. I actually heard a lot of slight for Campbell early in the season or early in the offseason. I don't think that's there anymore. Then the other game, a and versus South Carolina State. And I just feel like this is the team that took over the mantle as, oh, I'm the top dog in the MEAC now that you're gone. Let's see what these two going against, right? That That's my my reasoning behind it. But I do want to get to some of the viewer submissions because there were some phenomenal answers in here, man. I thought that uh, the Burger Popper, right? I'm going to name out the people. Um, the Burger Popper, he said, not a lot of people in, not a lot of people are talking about North Carolina Central versus New Hampshire. A chance to get a signature win over the MEAC or for the MEAC over the CAA. I thought that was a good one. I thought that was a good one because everybody wants to talk about the, the CAA. They're like completely opposites, right? So, Everything that we were talking about, about the MEAC dying over the offseason, flip that. The CAA is growing rapidly, right? So I think it would be kind of cool to see the dying conference get one over the growing conference. That would be kind of dope. Then DJ Heartless, probably my favorite answer. He said, probably Howard versus MEAC, or excuse me, Howard versus Morehouse, bringing HBCU football back to New York. I said, you know what? I love it. I love it because this is two prestigious HBCUs going against each other and bringing this back in a way that, hey, let's talk about the surroundings of the game. I love context. Like, what's going on in the field is amazing. But the context and the storylines around games, to me, that really sells things. Howard, Morehouse, bringing football back to the New York area and having it with two prestigious HBCUs who name rings bell nationwide. I loved it. I absolutely love it. And I think that was a great answer, right? So I didn't want to steal that one. Then you had BJ Jones who said SFA versus Alcorn. And then you also got the same answer from GA. And GA actually came back with a second answer as well. And he said Tennessee State versus Jackson State, which I thought was kind of interesting because it's a Jackson State game. And a lot of people don't look at Jackson State games as underrated. How could you say that? It sounds wild. Obviously, I don't think it's wild because I had Jackson State versus Texas Southern on mine. So I think that JSU games can be underrated. And I think that this one has a little hint of it because it's the last year the, of the uh, Southern Heritage Classic. It's a game that I feel like is losing. It's, it's a rivalry that's really losing its luster. Yeah, I feel like people are not talking about it. I think that a lot of people think it's FAMU, Jackson State, South Carolina State. And those are the only two teams that are even comparable to Jackson State, FAMU and South Carolina State. Everybody else is an afterthought. If you're not Alcorn and you fighting for Mississippi, or what are we really talking about? But I think that Jackson State versus Tennessee State has, in a way, became slightly underrated. Um, Let's go to Malik uh, OB. I hope I got that right. Oh, my God. They're going to kill me at draft HBCU. Um, but Malik, Norfolk State versus Sacred Heart, which could be a major win for Coach Odoms. I told you I love – Absolutely love the storylines attached to it because, yeah, let's get a big win for the coach. Let's get a big time win where people are like, oh, okay, maybe we should put some respect on the name of Norfolk State, right? So anyway, let's continue rolling. We're almost wrapping up. Man, that guy Blue, man, Blue Bloods came on the show. He dropped three on me. I'm like, come on, man, come on, man. 
He dropped me Tennessee State, Eastern Washington versus Eastern Washington, North Carolina Central versus Campbell, Norfolk State versus Sacred Heart. So we have another one of those repeats coming up. Central versus Campbell is something I also had mentioned before. So these are some of the, th the uh, teams and matchups that you gave. And, of course, I got to end it off with Gerald Huggins. First off, G, you know you're wrong. You know you're wrong for starting this podcast. I had to find out through, through being tagged on Twitter, man. Come on. It's supposed, to, it's supposed to hit my phone, man. But anyway, Huggins said, North Carolina Central versus North Carolina A&T may be the best HBCU game this weekend. I cannot wait to watch it. And another listener, Alejandro Sosa, said, watch out for the running back, Bashal uh, Tutin, Tutton, I think it's Tutton, uh, number 33 for AT&T, A&T. Jesus Christ. What is wrong with me? I'm off today. But, yeah, North Carolina Central versus A&T is definitely a great game. And I think I probably will look at one of those storylines because there's a storyline about the defensive staff between each team that I actually think is kind of interesting. I'll try to put that in there somewhere, probably at the end of Friday's show if not somewhere in Thursday's show. We'll see about it. But those are the people who sent it in. I'm going to start doing this more often. I'm going to start having listeners comment. I want to make you a part of the show. Let me know if you like this, though, where I'm just reading off what people said as a part of a segment. I really think it's fun, and it's a nice way for you to feel like, oh, the mouth of the South heard me. The mouth of the South wants to bring everybody on the show. So that's what I'm here for. Going forward, we're going to talk about the fate of our HBCU rookies. We had seven guys that we were looking for. Let's break down where each guy landed and why this is not the end of the road for any of them. We're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU with the fate of our HBCU rookies. Now, yesterday was a big day in the NFL. It was roster cuts. And with that, you're going to trim your roster down to 53. You can start off with 90 during the offseason. And slowly but surely, the cuts happen, the cuts happen, the cuts happen. And then when you get to the 53-man roster, this is looked at as the active roster. This is the initial roster. Things happen. Sometimes teams have to put a player on the, on the roster, then put them on IR. So then you can, just because you're not on the roster right now, doesn't mean you won't get on the roster before week one. And just because you're on the roster right now, doesn't automatically mean that you'll be there week one. It's always in flux. See, roster day or roster cut day is important for about probably 10 to 15 people who are on that bubble. That bubble of, you know what, you might make that 53. There's probably 30-some-odd players on every team that knows they're making a the roster, but then you have those other 23 players who are like, I don't know if I'm going to make it, right? This is important for them. And all HBCU players, for the most part, uh, HBCU rookies are on that list. We're going to list off the seven, and that is Marquise Bell with the Cowboys, James Houston with the Lions, Shamar Bridges with the Ravens, Kobe Durant with the Rams, Joshua Williams with the Chiefs, Detire Carter with the Bears, and the Deshaun Dixon with the Jaguars. If there's somebody on this list or somebody who isn't on this list that you want to know, leave a comment. I'll look up their fate, and I'll share it with you as soon as I see it. But these are the seven that I've been looking at and keeping my eyes on to see what they're going to do. So let's go through them one by one. Marquise Bell was a roster lock who was told to us, or at least that's what was told to us by Mar uh, Marcus Mosher. It was true. I think that Bell has done so much during the preseason, specifically in that, that second preseason game. And he got an interception in the third one as well. So Bell's been making a lot of headway or headway. So this comes by no surprise. And I'm not just talking about the fact that I loved his talent coming out of the draft. It's not just that. It's just the fact that he's actually been producing really freaking well when we're talking about in the preseason. Now let's go to some of our drafted guys. We want to start off with the Kobe Durant. Or let's start off with Joshua Williams because he led the Chiefs and tackles. I've heard really good things about him throughout the preseason. He made the roster. That was not a surprise. I knew he was going to make the roster based off where he was drafted. A fourth-round pick who I felt was there to help bolster that, that secondary. Somebody who could be a, a future impact player for them. They drafted another rookie corner in Trent McDuffie. So I don't know how much time he'll play this year. But I do think we'll see Joshua Williams on the field. And it might not only be through special teams. Going to Kobe Durant. We know what he's about, man. Kevin Durant's cousin. He came out, he balled out in the second preseason game, got his hand on the ball. He didn't come down with it. He got a sack. This guy was playing, and he's somebody who has been really producing in camp. It's, it's important when you produce in camp, and then you also measure up in the games because now they know, okay, you're not just a camp guy. You can do it against other players as well. Let's continue going. Jatire Carter, he made the team for the, for the Bears. I kind of felt that. He got some first-team reps at the beginning of practice. Also, they're kind of trying to revitalize their offensive line. 
trying to give Justin Fields a little bit of protection. I felt as if he was going to make this team. I don't know what gave me such confidence, but I did feel like he was going to make the team, even though I wasn't really able to catch much of the Chicago Bears during the preseason. Something about his placement toward the beginning really made me feel like this was a roster spot that was meant for him. He just had to make sure he didn't let go of the grip. Now we're going to go to James Houston, who unfortunately did not make the team. And he was somebody who got a lot of praise, the best player on the field in the first practice, right? But he just didn't get on the field during the preseason. He just didn't get many snaps. I think he got 14 snaps in the last preseason game, nine of which were on defense, five on special teams. When you're not getting many snaps in the preseason, you're probably not going to make it, you know? And maybe they're trying to stash him. That's a, that's a case where you know you're not going to put him on your team, so maybe you try to stash him on the practice squad. This is the first guy we're talking about who didn't make the, the team. I believe that James Houston is a practice squad player. He had a lot of potential. It seemed like Dan Campbell liked him. I know that we liked him here, but he generated a little bit of buzz. The coach seemed to like him. They just have a lot of linebackers in that room, so I could genuinely see him being a practice squad player, and maybe they even try to work on where exactly we're going to put him. Are we going to put him as a defensive end? Are we going to put him as a linebacker? Are we going to try to make him where he can really be that versatile to play both? That year of a red shirt in sorts could do wonders for them actually figuring out how they want to use him. And once they figure out how they want to use him, oh, now he can go and unleash the freak. Now he can go on and he can actually become the problem. So we got a team player on my team. I don't think they know how they want to use the guy, and that's why I think he's not effective. Let's figure out how you want to use a guy first, and then let's go. Now we're going to go to – we talked about – Durant, Williams, Carter, Houston, Bell. Now we're going to go to Shamar Bridges, my man, man. Unfortunately, he didn't make the Ravens. I really think he's a strong practice squad candidate. He just unfortunately did not follow up on that first preseason game where he was a monster, man. It looked like, oh, yeah, this guy's making the, the team for sure. I came out and predicted that he was going to make the team before that happened, and I was really feeling myself after that. Unfortunately, there just wasn't as much production in games two and three but listen, you saw the talent. He was doing it during practice, basically all, all practice, all training camp. So you know that he has the talent. You've seen him able to do it against another opponent. You probably just want to see him do it more often. You probably want to see him do it two or three times. And then when they signed Demarcus Robinson, it kind of felt like, okay, he's going to come in and fill that last wide receiver spot. But Shamar Bridges is 100% a practice squad candidate and somebody I think that the Ravens or somebody else after seeing that first game is going to try to put on their practice squad. Then finally, we're going to wrap it up with Deshaun Dixon, who did make the Jacksonville Jaguars. And I was happy because, hey, this was a guy who in his first game on the Hall of Fame game had a sack. And I said, oh, we here. He led the team in tackles, eight tackles in a tackle for a loss and then also a sack in the final preseason game. This is a player who, when you look at his preseason production, two out of the four games he played jump off the screen to me. I seen him producing two out of the four games. So I kind of was confident that he was going to make it. Mind you, these two players who did not make it in Houston and Bridges, it doesn't mean they won't make the practice squad. I actually believe both of them are good practice squad candidates. It's about getting there, though. We'll see if they do, if they're not picked up by somebody else. But that's our show. I appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day. Every day for your second listen of the day, make sure you are checking out our conference shows like Locked on ACC, Locked on Big 12, Pac-12, and then SEC. I'll be back tomorrow with our favorite storylines on my favorite personal right we're not even gonna go with rankings my personal favorite storylines going into the 2022 season for all hbcus now with that being said in the meantime in between time you can follow me on twitter at south exclusives until the next time that we hear each other family take care stay blessed peace